Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Dale Bredesen, a physician, researcher, professor, author, and world-renowned expert in the mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for joining us on Redefining Medicine. Thanks very much for having me, Phil. So uh, let's jump right into the deep end. Uh, you wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's, which is a provocative title. Are you suggesting that we have a cure for Alzheimer's disease? No, and I don't use the term cure in there. What I'm suggesting is that Alzheimer's should be a rare disease, which it should be. Um, this is a trillion dollar global problem, as you know, um, that has been on the rise. Uh, if we look at the currently living Americans, uh, of the 325 million or so of us, and ask how many of us during our lifetime will get this disease? The answer is about 45 million of us will get this disease during our lifetime. So it is a huge and growing problem. And in fact, it need not be nearly as common as it is. There's a tremendous amount we can do about it. And we've documented this in multiple peer reviewed publications. We published one in 2018 that showed 100 documented uh, cases with improvement. And of course, easier than improvement is prevention. But people have stayed away from these things. They have not used appropriate and optimal approaches uh, because everyone tells us that there's nothing that can be done. So we spent 30 years laboratory research looking at what are the drivers? What is this problem? And you know, at the heart of Alzheimer's, what we found is that it is actually an insufficiency there is an insufficiency that can be related to oxygenation, can be related to blood flow, can be related to an insufficiency of clearing pathogens, an insufficiency of clearing toxins, an insufficiency of clearing misfolded proteins. And people often say, oh, you know, just get rid of those misfolded proteins, everything will be fine. No, that's part of an overall program. So this is a complex chronic illness much like the other complex chronic illnesses that are killing most of us today. And the old fashioned medical approach, which unfortunately is still in use by about 95% or more of physicians, is to try to treat each thing with a single drug. And that has not worked for Alzheimer's disease. Of course, it has not worked for other neurodegenerative diseases. And of course, these have been the areas of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. So as they say, everybody knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. Well, we've documented many now. Uh, we're just finishing up the first clinical trial in which instead of predetermining a treatment and saying, we're gonna treat you with Aricept or Nemenda or what have you, we're instead asking for each person what's actually driving the cognitive decline. And if you think about it for 10 seconds, you'll realize it makes no sense to predetermine a treatment. It's like taking your car in and they always say, fill it up with gas, fill it up with gas. That's all they ever say. Well, it's gonna work for a few cars, but for lots of cars, there'll be all sorts of other things going on. So the same thing here for these people, we look at dozens and dozens of different potential contributors, and then we address those contributors. So very enthusiastic about uh, finishing that up and getting that published next year, because I think that is the way of the future. And no question, the drugs are going to be important when used as part of an overall approach, as opposed to trying to do everything with a single shot. It's a little bit, again, like predetermining is kind of like saying, we're going to try to hit the moon with a space shot. We're going to aim it randomly, and we're not going to do anything when it's on its way, and we'll see if we hit it. Well, the chance of hitting it is extremely low. And that's what we're doing with these single drug approaches. Yeah, you refer to it as there's no silver bullet, but perhaps a silver buckshot. 
Exactly. So you need to know what the targets are. And they are, first of all, they're different for each person. And second of all, they're multiple for each person. So very rarely do you see someone who develops Alzheimer's because one thing went wrong. It's typically several different things. You have to identify those and then you have to address those things. That's the idea of silver buckshot. So to what extent is uh, Alzheimer's disease um, genetically uh, determined and to what extent is it environmentally influenced? So there, there are two parts to the genetics. There is the rare case, so less than 5% of cases where there is a very highly penetrant, essentially 100% penetrant gene, which is APP mutations, PS1 or PS2. Those are the uncommon causes. But in those cases, there's been no treatment. People, everyone who has the mutation will get the disease typically. Very interested in what we can do with prevention in those people. Uh, but for 95 plus percent of us, uh, it is a sporadic disease. Now within that, there is an important, there are about over 30 genes that can increase your risk, but they don't have the 100% penetrance, for example, that the APP mutations do. So you have people who have an increased risk just as you would for cardiovascular disease. And so there's a lot you can do about it. And again, people have been told in the past, don't bother to find out if you're APOE4 positive. That's the most common one. So about two thirds of people with Alzheimer's are APOE4 positive, but that leaves another third that are APOE4 negative. So that simply increases your risk. Uh, so again, yes, genetics important in risk, but they're typically not telling you your fate. Is it a, a situation where um, once you're past a certain point, you, you can't make any advances or can, can you actually take somebody who has been diagnosed, you know, uh, uh, with uh, full on Alzheimer's and, and, and reverse that to a degree? Yeah, that's a really good point. So what we found now, and there've been over 5,000 people who've gone on the protocol that we've developed and first published back in, in 2014. So for prevention, that's relatively straightforward. And we haven't had examples so far of people who have gone on prevention, done the program and then developed dementia. Now, time will tell, you know, we need more time, but at least so far, so good. People who then move into SCI, and as you know, you really have a 20 year approximately run up from the beginning of the pathophysiology to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So if you don't do prevention, we recommend please get in with earliest symptoms because as you know, this thing can sneak up on you. People will say, well, you know, I'm not that bad yet. Uh, you know, I'm not that much worse than my spouse. That all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of excuses that people will come up with, but best to get in early. So that's the period of SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. And by definition, what that means is you know there's a problem. Often your spouse knows there's a problem. Your, your, your close friends may know as well, but you're still testing in the normal range on neuropsychological quantitative assessments. Virtually 100% of those people get better with the approach that we take. Then you, if you don't do something, and that may last 10 years, you really do have quite a window. Then you move to MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And then by definition there, you are now scoring abnormally on neuropsychological quantitative assessments, but you still have intact your activities of daily living. Most of those people will get better on the approach that we have taken. Then if you don't do anything all those periods, so about the people who have MCI, about five to 10% will convert to dementia, which means they're beginning to lose activities of daily living. So as you can see, what we call full on Alzheimer's disease is really like saying widely metastatic cancer. This is a very, very late stage of something where there's a tremendous amount you can do with prevention and early reversal and even mid-stage reversal. Now the people who have Alzheimer's, we have had people who have MOCA scores of zero. So this is end stage who have still shown improvement, but they don't typically have improvement all the way to normal, but they may regain the ability to dress themselves, the ability to speak, the ability to, uh, you know, to read, things like that. So yes, 
what happens is it's harder and harder the later and later, and you have to do more and more the later and later you start, which is why we encourage everyone, please get in as early as possible. So I, I know this is a multifactorial approach uh, and it's personalized too to the individual, but could you give us an idea of, of some of the, uh, the, the ways that you approach the protocol? Absolutely. So what we do is we're first looking at all these different contributors and then we subtype people. So there are people who have more of an inflammatory Alzheimer's, which is what we call type one or inflammatory or hot Alzheimer's. There are people who have more like type two, which is atrophic. It's a very different process. You're reducing the support, trophic factors, hormones, and nutrients that are critical for keeping your brain supported, keeping your synapses supported. And then type 1.5, and we call it that because it has features of both inflammation and atrophic effects. And these are people who have glycotoxicity with insulin resistance. These are the pre-diabetics and the type 2 diabetics and those of us who have insulin resistance. And then type 3, which is toxicity. And these people have typically three different types of toxins. Number one is metallotoxins and other inorganics, things like uh, like smog, like, like uh, air pollution. Type two, uh, or the second group of these, organic toxins, people exposed to glyphosate or, uh, or toluene or benzene or things like this. Um, and then the third group uh, is the biotoxins. These are typically toxins associated with mold exposures. And so things like trichothecenes and ochratoxin A uh, and gliotoxin and things like those. Uh, so, and then type four is vascular, type five is traumatic. So we subtype people and then we address those things. So typically we want people to make sure that they have appropriate blood flow, appropriate oxygenation. So many people don't realize that they don't. And of course, one of the common findings is that people are dropping their oxygen saturation at night while they're sleeping. Uh, of course, the tip of the iceberg there is the people who have full-on peripheral sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, but there are many who don't necessarily have that who still are dropping their oxygenation at night and improving that helps them. Optimizing their blood flow, getting them into mild ketosis. When you have Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, you have an energy gap. So you have a decreased glucose utilization in temporal and parietal regions. And so making, uh, bridging that gap, which you can do um, in part with ketones is actually quite helpful to people. And again, people have used all these things as monotherapies, but again, it's like the idea of saying, you know, that orchestra sounds horrible, everything's off. So I'm gonna get a new violin. Well, okay, that'll make things a little better, but you need to make sure that the clarinets are playing right, that the timpani is doing the right thing. To make this work, you know, your, your brain is complex. You've got somewhere around 500 trillion synapses. You are losing those synapses and the function of those synapses when you have Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's. So you wanna essentially get everything playing correctly. You wanna tune up all the different pieces to get best outcomes. So yes, you know, it does have to do with your diet, your exercise, your sleep, your stress, your brain training, but it's not just those things. It's looking at the things that are driving it for each person and addressing those. And we're able to do that now. This is something that was a, you know, a form of medicine that wasn't in great practice a couple of decades ago, um, but this is in, you know, in practice by many people today. So looking at all these critical things. So what's important to learn is what are the priorities? What are the things I need to look for? And there are some people who get lost in, well, I'm trying to work on homocysteine. Well, okay, homocysteine is important, but don't forget the most important things. If you're missing the critical pieces, then fixing one metabolic variable is not likely to have a big impact. A lot of the AFRM uh, physicians are watching these uh, podcasts. Um, what would be your uh, advice to them? Because uh, I'm sure many... Uh, uh, see patients who are presenting with uh, some early onset uh, dementia. It's a great point. And, you know, we're, anyone who's seeing patients is going to be seeing, because this is so common, people, especially in the earliest stages. And of course, we're all seeing people who are at risk. 
So I would urge them, please take some training. We've trained over 1,500 ph physicians from 10 different countries and all over the US. We've just come out with new training. We have some absolutely fantastic people teaching. Uh, Dr. Neil Nathan on biotoxins, Dr. Chris Shade uh, on chemotoxins, uh, Dr. Anne Hathaway on bioidentical hormone replacement, Dr. Cyrus Raji on neuroimaging, and on and on and on, a real all-star group here. And so I would encourage people to take the training and to look at, uh, at uh, how to get best outcomes, because we've had a number of people who've tried to kind of do this on their own without learning what actually works the best, and they're not, they've not gotten typically the best outcomes. So it's, it's not simple at the beginning, but with experience uh, and with appropriate training, uh, people are seeing just dramatic improvements uh, time and time again. Can you give us a, a website if somebody's interested in, in the program? Absolutely. So if you go on, um, you can either go on drbredesen.com or you can go on apollohealthco.com. The training is called RECODE, uh, R-E-C-O-D-E, -E, which is for reversal of cognitive decline. Okay, thanks. And then in terms of your book, it, was that written for physicians or more for the general public? Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, so the first book, uh, which, as you mentioned, is uh, the end of Alzheimer's, uh, was written, and initially it was written for everybody. Uh, Random House said, no, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's too technical. Um, and so we did rewrite it, and it should be readable for everybody. We do have, I have got specific couple of chapters in there, chapter five and six, that are specifically for physicians to look at how this all works, what's the research. I also have at the back in the appendix a formal proof of why this works the way it does um, for anyone who's interested. But for the rest of the book, it's written for everybody so that people can, can understand what's going on. Now we've just come out, many people after the first book said, we need more details, we need more basics, we need more URLs, we need more about workarounds, where do we find this, how do we do it, what do we buy, you know, on and on and on. And so we did then just recently publish a second book, which is called uh, The End of Alzheimer's program. So this is the program that goes with the first. The first book is more conceptual and showing that, yeah, this is possible. And here are some examples. The second book is really about what do I do? Where do I go? It's completely practical and therefore was written with two other people. I teamed up with a user, who, who Julie G, who's doing this herself every day and has had just dramatically uh, fantastic results where she's gone from 35th percentile to 98th percentile. And she talks a little bit about this in there. Uh, and then also with my wife, Dr. Aida Lachine Bredesen, who is a functional medicine physician. So we have a scientist, a clinician, and a, and a user uh, put together so that we can uh, give best outcomes. So the idea is to make it accessible to every person. That's great. I've heard you say that uh, you feel as though ours is the last generation that will have to uh, fear uh, Alzheimer's. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, we have two daughters uh, who are in their late 20s uh, and their generation, you know, uh, we encourage everyone when they hit 45, get a cognoscopy, just as we all know, we should be getting a colonoscopy when we turn uh, 50. Uh, and, you know, look what happened with pap smears that changed the, the, the concern, uh, you know, uh, about uh, gynecological cancers uh, and especially obviously about uh, cervical and uterine uh, cancers, huge change as people began to, to screen and look. And so I think we're in the same sort of situation now where people can do something. We can do something about this. So we encourage everyone to check early on. And so uh, with, uh, you know, with looking at uh, the current generation, uh, these people should not have to fear. This should become a much less common disease. So we should all working together be able to reduce the global burden of dementia. This is a huge global problem, as you know. That's very exciting. Well, thank you for your important work and research in this area, and thank you for taking the time to share that with us today on Redefining Medicine. Thanks so much, Phil. Appreciate your having me.